Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Roman and I'm a blood and cancer doctor and I recently did a video titled Pancreatic Cysts, especially IPMNs and uh, in this video or due to this video I've been asked various questions and I'm going to cover some of these questions on video format. I thought that this would be a pretty neat way of doing this and hopefully I'm able to help you out. Before I get into it, remember I'm not your doctor, I'm not giving you any specific advice. Watch at your own risk. Any medical advice pertaining to your case, that's what your doctor is for. So uh, the first question is, what about genetic testing in patients with an IPMN, specifically genetic testing for uh, pancreas cancer? So first of all, when you get a genetic test done, we're talking about hereditary genetic testing or germline testing. It's the same thing. It can be done either on a blood sample or saliva swabs and they send out to see if you were born with a genetic abnormality or a DNA abnormality that can increase your risk of cancer. And it can either be negative, meaning normal, they did not find a mutation, or sometimes it can come back with a positive result, meaning they did find an abnormality. Now, if they did find a DNA mutation, it can come back of one of five ways. It can either be a pathogenic variant. In other words, yes, they found a mutation that has been linked to cancer or a likely pathogenic. This would be the second one in which it is likely associated with cancer or a VUS, also known as a variant of undetermined or unknown significance. In this case, they found a mutation, but they're not sure if it is or if it is not associated with cancer, although the majority of these tend to not be associated with cancer, but we don't have enough info to draw a conclusion here. The fourth possibility is a likely benign. Again, they yes, they found a mutation, but it is likely not associated with cancer or a benign mutation. In other words, they found a mutation, but it has not been linked to cancer. So now we're going to go over what about the cases in which they found the mutation and it is pathogenic or likely pathogenic. Okay. The, the sticking to the topic of pancreatic cancer or IPMNs, which was the specific question I was asked. There's a few mutations. The most common ones are the BRCA1, BRCA2, the PALB B2, the ATM mutation. There, there are several out there. Just know number one, not all of these mutations are pathogenic or likely pathogenic. There are variances out there, which may be a variant of undetermined significance or unknown significance. So you got to make sure you have a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation. The second thing, you know, the numbers are all over the place as far as cancer risk. Just know that some of these mutations are associated with several types of cancer, not just one. And your risk of cancer may be higher in one areas than they are in others. For example, the BRCA one and two is associated with pancreatic cancer, but it's much more associated in women with breast cancer. So that's just an example. You have to educate yourself as far as which mutation do you have? Is it pathogenic? And what are the cancer risk and what steps do you have to take? And we'll, we'll go over that briefly in a little bit. So just know that the, the percentages of cancer risk vary anywhere as far as pancreatic cancer is concerned between 2% all the way up to 10%. Some may be a little higher, the, a lot may be a lot lower. Again, these numbers are all over the place. I'm not giving a specific number here because all this does is cause stress. Just know that if you have a, a pathogenic variant, you know, it just means you have to be a little more vigilant and looking out for yourself a little more. So especially if you have a mutation and an IPMN, it just makes sense. Uh, all right. So keeping that in mind, the first question, if you have one of these mutations is, do you have a family history of pancreatic cancer? And if the answer is yes, then that uh, will put your, your vigilance a little higher on the list. Now I can tell you, I have found patients with all of these mutations and they've never had cancer. And all of a sudden now I'm seeing them maybe at the age of 80 for uh, prostate cancer or some other type of malignancy. I send off genetic testing because we have treatment options now, depending on your, some genetic mutations. That's why I sent the test in an 80 year old, but the test will come back positive, meaning they had, they have a pathogenic variant, but yet they're 80 years old and they never had cancer before. So it just goes to show you that just because you have one of these mutations does not mean, yes, you're going to develop cancer. A lot of people do not. So always keep that in mind. 
The next thing you need to do is consider genetic counseling. I'm using my little sheet here because I wrote down some key points I wanted to go over. So genetic counseling, you want to know what cancers are you at risk for? Do you have an increased risk? Ballpark figure what your risk is. Having your family tested, you want to make sure if you have siblings or children that they're tested as well to try to, you know, the whole goal here is to try to prevent malignancy or cancer from developing. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, the question that I was asked is, should I be screened for pancreatic cancer? And the answer is, every, there are guidelines here all over the place. Some recommend it, some don't, some say to consider. Everybody, you know, every every country or every area, every asso uh, association out there has some sort of uh, their own guideline, and this is ever changing. But just note, the overall consensus is that if you have one of these pathogenic variants, you should consider being screened, uh, especially after the age of 50, because that's where the risk tends to increase a little more. Um, especially if you have a positive family history of pancreatic cancer, then yes, you should consider screening. You know, they have to take uh, factors into consideration as far as the cost benefit ratio, a lot goes into this. Now there's some associations that are recommending that you have screening done. If you have, for example, a BRCA one or two gene, um, even if you don't have a family history. So short answer is ask your physician, consider genetic counseling and see, you know, what is the best thing in your case. Just know that if you have one of these mutations, but you also have an IPMN, you're being monitored anyway. So honestly, I really don't think it changes much. The way that I use it, and I know some other doctors do not recommend testing for this. The reason I recommend testing is because it just makes me a little more vigilant in your case and if for example you have some worrisome features or intermediate high grade uh, risk factors if you will in your ipmn i may be a little more prone to recommending surgery that's the way that i use it so i hope that that answers uh your question for the person who asked it the other question that i was asked is does the number of ipmns or the location of the ipmn within the pancreas does that increase the cancer risk? And the answer is no. So very easy answer. Just note that you can have two, three, four, five IPMNs. If they're all low grade, excellent. You may have one IPMN that has intermediate to high grade. That's a much worse scenario. That's why the number of IPMN in general is not within the, the high risk features, as well as the location. No, if it's in the head of the pancreas versus the tail, does not increase your risk. The only thing is if you have a lesion in the head of the pancreas, you're more likely to require a Whipple surgery if surgery is required. Whereas if it's in the tail and surgery is required, you would re then they would perform a distal pancreatectomy. But as far as your risk is concerned, as far as I'm aware, and I've read up on everything I can get my hands on, the answer is no. So I hope that that answers the question to the person who asked me that one. The last question I was asked, which is an excellent question, they're all excellent questions, but this question I actually struggle with all the time, and it's, should I FNA my pancreatic cyst? So very difficult question. There's a lot that goes into this. So first of all, why not do it? Well, it's the risk. The main risk is infection or pancreatitis. Uh, so, you know, for me, if you have a benign appearing lesion, so let's say you have an endoscopic ultrasound and it appears very benign. It looks, there's no intermediate risk features, no high risk features. I, in my particular case, I told my endoscopist, you know what, do not put a needle in there if it's completely benign appearing. Now, if there's some intermediate risk uh, features or uh, high grade uh, findings, you know, that you're worried, uh, then in that case, okay, we may start to consider in this case, putting a needle in there to sending off fluid for analysis. I also said, you know what? If when you go in there, you find a vein, I'm gonna just use very simple street language, if you will. If you see an ugly looking cyst, okay? I have what appears to be an IPNM and it's nasty looking. You know, it, it looks that like there's a high probability just by looking at it, that it's cancer, then you know what? Don't put a needle in it. I'm gonna go to surgery anyway. So why poke the bear? And the reason I, I say this is because there is a theoretical, theoretical, I don't want to scare people, there is a theoretical risk that if there are cancer cells within that cyst and I biopsy or I aspirate, I could possibly 
spread some of these cancer cells. Now, this is gonna open up a can of worms. I know people are gonna start going crazy, asking questions on this. Again, I said this is theoretical. We do these uh, aspirates all the time. 99% of the times they provide much greater benefit than any possible risk. I can't stress this enough. But again, the only reason in this case is if you're going to go to surgery anyway, no matter what the aspirate shows, because it's a nasty looking pancreatic cyst, then just take me to surgery. Once surgery is done, we'll have all the tissue in the world to be analyzed. And remember, an aspirate is not 100% in any way, shape, or form. So just because I do an aspirate, if it comes back negative, I cannot rest uh, knowing 100% that I am out of the woods. No, none of these tests are 100%. The only one that's almost 100%, if not 100%, is taking out the complete cyst and having it evaluated. So I hope that this answers your questions. I'm going to continue this format as I'm asked questions. As you can tell, a lot goes into these questions for me to just answer this on a text or on a comment section in YouTube, very difficult. So keep the questions coming. Uh, thank you for your attention. Consider subscribing and I'll catch you on the next video. Bye.